Thank you, Dr. Levine, for that kind introduction. I also would like to thank Dr. Victor Test and the Board of Regents for giving me the opportunity to be your keynote speaker for the CHESS 2020 annual meeting. Before beginning my talk, I want to extend my deep gratitude to the CHESS community for your tireless dedication to patient care during this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. At great risk to your own health, your teams have been at the forefront of the COVID-19 response, offering expert care and compassion to patients who are not only sick, but also separated from their loved ones. Additionally, as a medical society, your members have collaborated to produce and share valuable resources that healthcare professionals everywhere can use to increase their clinical knowledge base and raise their level of care. CHEST has demonstrated how to be a global leader during an historic public health emergency. And I thank you and commend each of you for your contributions and your service. As you can see from this first slide, I've decided to talk to you today about both the public health and the scientific challenges associated with the unprecedented pandemic outbreak of COVID-19. Several months ago in January of this year, my colleagues and I wrote a viewpoint for the Journal of the American Medical Association, which I chose to entitle Coronavirus Infections More Than Just the Common Cold. I chose that title not to be facetious, but to point out to the readers that we have been dealing with coronavirus infections for decades and decades and decades. In fact, in this coronavirus phylogenetic tree, you see the human coronaviruses, which are designated in red letters. In addition, bats and other intermediate hosts are very important reservoirs for coronaviruses. The four viruses that are indicated with the yellow coloring are the four coronaviruses that are responsible for the common colds, 15 to 30% of all the common colds that we repetitively experience usually during the winter months. In addition, in 2002, we had our first experience with a coronavirus that was pandemic, namely the SARS coronavirus one, which emerged out of Guangdong province in China from a bat to a civet cat to a human, resulting in 8,000 infections and almost 800 deaths. 10 years later, in 2012, we had the MERS coronavirus from a bat to a camel to a human in Saudi Arabia, the second of the pandemics. And here they are now, the two major pandemic coronaviruses that our civilization has experienced. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is still smoldering a bit in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, whereas the SARS coronavirus, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, spontaneously disappeared because of very aggressive and successful public health measures, such as isolation, identification, quarantine, et cetera. Now, today, in 2020, we're faced with the third of the coronaviruses that are of potential and real pandemic nature. In the end of December of 2019, uh, outbreak of unusual pneumonia cases was seen in the Wuhan district of China. As it turned out, this was yet again another pandemic coronavirus, which the Chinese identified in January and put on a public data base. Back to the phylogenetic tree, as you can see in the yellow box, SARS coronavirus 2, because of its phylogenetic proximity to the original SARS coronavirus, was now led to a renaming. The original SARS is now COVID-1, and the SARS coronavirus 2 is the one that we're currently dealing with. Just for the terminology's sake, the disease itself is called COVID-19, whereas the virus, as I mentioned, is referred to as SARS coronavirus 2. So fast forward to where we are today. We are now in the middle of an explosive pandemic of historic proportions, the likes of which we have not experienced in the last 102 years, 
with over a million deaths worldwide and 38 million cases, and the end is not in sight. Unfortunately for the United States, we are the worst hit country in the world with 7.7 .7 million cases and over 214,000 deaths. The heat map of the states shown on this slide show the relative proportion of cases per 100,000, which as you see, are focused in different regions of the country, particularly the southern states. I want to talk a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between what happened in the United States versus what happened in Europe. As shown on this slide in the blue line, the European Union had their peak slightly before we did in the United States. But once their peak burned out and was under control because of shutdown methodology, namely they shut down the countries in the European Union, their case rate per day went down to a very low baseline level, well below 10,000 new cases per day. Whereas the United States, although we were hit very hard as represented predominantly by the northeastern part of the country, namely the New York metropolitan area, when they went down to a low baseline, the rest of the country began to spike. And that's the reason why in the red line, we never get down below the level and at the level that the European Union did. We went along at about 20,000 new cases for a couple of months until the attempt to open up the economy in the summer months, the early summer months in the Southern states led to a surge of up to about 70,000 new cases per day, which then came back down and is now plateaued to somewhere between 40 and 50,000 new cases each day, a situation that we do not want to be in as we approach the cooler months of the fall and the colder months of the winter. Why did the United States do so differently with regard to their baseline? If you look at the extent to which different countries shut down and compare the United States to the European Union as represented by Italy and Spain, you can measure mobility in different places. And so when you have a degree of mobility that decreases, it tells you the extent to which you shut down. And when you look at mobility in parks and outdoor spaces, note the United States is not nearly as shut down as Italy and Spain. If you look at in the workplace, again, the United States in the dark line is not nearly as decreased as Italy and Spain. And when simple things like trips to the grocery store and the pharmacy store, the United States does not shut down nearly as much as Italy and Spain. That's the epidemiology. Let's switch now to the virology. As I showed you on the phylogenetic tree, this is a beta coronavirus. It is an RNA virus with a number of structural proteins, the most important which is the spike protein with its receptor binding domain that binds to the central and typical and predominant receptor for the virus, the ACE2 receptor, widely distributed on cells throughout the body, including the upper and lower respiratory tract and the GI tract, as well as other organ systems. The virus is transmitted by the respiratory route with exposure to respiratory droplets. Six feet distance is when most droplets can actually stay in the air. There are some particles that are aerosolized that can go greater distances and stay in the air for longer periods of time. Less commonly, one can be infected with contaminated surfaces, but that really is not at all the primary modality of transmission. The virus can be found in other body fluids, but their role in transmission is unclear and likely minimal. Animals, including domesticated pets, as well as zoo animals can be infected. Again, the role as a source of human infection is very likely minimal. The type and duration of exposure indicates how one can get transmitted and the efficiency of that, including individual factors such as viral load. 
Transmissions are most common in household contacts, as well as in congregate settings, such as closed situations as cruise ships, nursing homes, and prisons. Factors that may increase the risk of airborne transmission are crowded in closed places with poor ventilation, as well as singing, speaking loudly, or breathing heavily. If one looks at community exposures, what is the more likely place for there to be transmission? What stands out are restaurants, gyms, bars, and even some religious or church gatherings. Something about this virus that is quite unique is the fact that of all the people who have been infected, about 40 to 45% are without symptoms. And in fact, if you look at the transmission of infection, a substantial proportion of the transmissions occurring from an asymptomatic person to an uninfected person. The fundamental mechanisms of preventing the acquisition and transmission of the virus are the universal wearing of masks or cloth face coverings, maintaining physical distances, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, doing things outdoors much more preferentially than indoors, and frequent washing of hands. The clinical manifestations of protean highly resembling a flu-like syndrome as shown by the signs and symptoms on this slide. Of note, there's a peculiar loss of smell and taste in many patients that precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. The spectrum of disease severity is great. Mild to moderate disease in those who get symptoms in about 80% of individuals. Severe and critical in about 15 to 20% with the case fatality rate varying from a few percent to about 20 to 25% when people require artificial ventilation and mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are predominantly the acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, but also other organ systems have now, the more we learn about the clinical manifestations, the more we see of the protean manifestations, such as cardiac injury as manifested by arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies, often leading to sudden death, kidney injuries, neurological injuries, hypercoagulability as manifested by microthrombi in small vessels and thromboembolic phenomenon leading to strokes, sometimes in otherwise normal, healthy individuals. In addition, there's a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which strongly resembles Kawasaki syndrome. There is now increased appreciation of what is being referred to as a post-COVID-19 syndrome, in which individuals who, re who recover virologically, in other words, their disease from a virological standpoint is over, they no longer have virus in them that's replication competent, yet they have persistent symptomatology, such as shortness of breath, myalgias, fatigue, dysautonomia, fever, and in some cases, what they refer to as brain fog or a inability to concentrate or to focus. If you look at those who are at increase for severe illness, it's divided into two major buckets. Older individuals are among the first. Here you see from this slide is the extraordinary variability and disparity between the hospital rate per 100,000 population of young individuals on the right-hand side of the slide compared to elderly 75 years of age or older on the right-hand part of the slide with a dramatically increase in the rate of hospitalization per 100,000. In addition, people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions are at increased risk for severe disease. And those that have a strong association with an increased risk are shown on this slide, particularly pointing out those who have heart conditions, diabetes, obesity, and a variety of other chronic conditions shown on this slide. There are medical conditions that may confer an increased risk for severe illness with COVID-19, 
Again, they're listed on this slide. I want to point out a few that are particularly important, including overweight, a BMI between 25 but less than 30, type 1 diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. We've noted very clearly a disturbing racial and ethnic disparity involving African Americans, Latinx, American, uh, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Pacific Islanders, with an increase not only in the incidence of infection, but in the serious complications associated with infections, particularly because minorities have an increased incidence and prevalence of the comorbidities, which actually lead to a severe outcome. The difference in hospitalization rates among minorities is dramatically shown on this slide. The two top bars are Latinx and Blacks with 375 and 368 hospitalization rate per 100,000 compared to 82 in the white non-Hispanics. With regard to treatment therapeutics, the NIH has put together a treatment guidelines panel, which is a group of experts in the clinical care of COVID-19 patients who work on a living document in which they meet frequently to update a document on the most recent clinical data with recommendations about how to care for and treat individuals with COVID-19. It's easily accessible on the website shown on the slide, COVID-19 treatment guidelines.nih.gov. These are a list of some of the therapeutics that are in play here and now. If you look at these, some are already recommended for treatment, but let's take a look at some of the ones that are now still being investigated. Direct antivirals, blood-derived products such as convalescent plasma, hyperimmune globulin, monoclonal antibodies, and immunomodulators. The two that have now been strongly recommended by the guidelines panel are remdesivir, which is used in hospitalized individuals who require oxygen for lung involvement. These individuals were shown in a more than 1,000 randomized placebo-controlled trial to have a significant diminution in the time to recovery compared to placebo. Dexamethasone used in advanced hospitalized patients requiring mechanical ventilation or requiring oxygen in a multi-thousand patient randomized placebo-controlled trial showed a significant diminution in the 28-day mortality. I wanna just spend a just quick moment to talk about some exciting data that's evolving now using monoclonal antibodies in which clinical trials are being conducted on an outpatient basis, an inpatient basis, family prophylaxis in which an individual in a family is infected and you prophylact the rest of the family to prevent infection, as well as broad primary prophylaxis in nursing homes. And finally, with regard to vaccines, we have adapted what's called the strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development. The federal government is involved in the direct involvement of developing as well as facilitating the, the uh, testing of six different vaccine candidates, five of which are already in phase three trial. When I say a strategic approach, I mean harmonizing the protocols to have a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and common immunological parameters for correlates of immunity. These are the three platforms, nucleic acid, which is messenger RNA, viral vectors, such as human adenovirus, chimp adenovirus, and VSV, as well as the more standard protein subunits. As you can see from the right-hand side of the slide, there are five of these in phase three trials, two of which started in July 27th. And given the rate of infection that's going on in this country, and the distribution of the clinical trial sites involving tens of thousands of volunteers, we project that we will have an answer as to whether or not we have a safe and effective vaccine by November or December of this year. It may come earlier this month in October, 
that is unlikely. It is more likely we'll have an answer in November and December. And based on the data that we've seen from animal studies and the data from the phase one trial, which indicate that the vaccine induces a robust neutralizing antibody response, equivalent to, if not greater than natural infection, we are cautiously optimistic. Again, with never a guarantee for a vaccine, we're cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine that would be safe and effective by the end of this year, and we'll be able to distribute doses at the end of this year and throughout the beginning and middle of 2021. I wanna close with this slide, which is the website if you want further information on any of the trials that are going on, or even if you'd like to register your own interest in being considered as a volunteer for one or more of these trials. I'll stop there and again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation.